Welcome. I am Cynthia Cook, the Director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And I am delighted to be able to welcome you to this event, Delivering for the Warfighter, the Importance of Executing Space Acquisition Programs. It is a true privilege to be able to introduce the Honorable Frank Calvelli, Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Space Acquisition and Integration. Secretary Cavelli serves as the Service Acquisition Executive for Space Systems and Programs within the Department of the Air Force and as the Chair of the Space Acquisition Council. Before his current role, Secretary Cavelli served as the Principal Deputy Director of the National Reconnaissance Office and had long service in the Central Intelligence Agency where he used and developed deep technical and operational knowledge and experience across national security space missions. Secretary Cavelli will offer some opening remarks and we will then enjoy a discussion moderated by the Honorable Carrie Bingen, who is CSIS's Aerospace Program Director. Carrie has had a notable career herself in government service as the former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security and on the Hill as the Policy Director on the House Armed Services Committee and Staff Leave for its Strategic Forces Subcommittee. Carrie asked me to introduce this event because I have long been researching a variety of space ac of acquisition issues, including space acquisition, for almost 30 years. From a policy research perspective, space acquisition challenges have always been complex, and they are getting com increasingly complicated with new commercial entrants across the space domain, enabling new architectures and new capabilities. The stand-up of the United States Space Force in 2019 offered the opportunity to develop a clean sheet approach for space acquisition. Before the discussion begins, it is worth noting the multiple lines of effort that Secretary Covelli has undertaken to tackle this thorny problem. He issued new space acquisition tenants in October of 2022, a formula for going fast in space acquisition in April of 2023, and he recently released a memo covering space acquisition program management skills in December of 2023. All offer pragmatic principles and steps gained from experience, both successes and failures, in delivering space capabil capabilities. Secretary Cavelli, thank you for coming to CSIS, and we look forward to your opening remarks. Thank you very much, Cynthia, and it is such a pleasure to get to work with Cynthia and her Defense Industry Initiatives Group every day here at CSIS uh, and to benefit from the tremendous knowledge that she has, not only in space acquisition, but in, in the defense industrial base at large. So I also share her welcome to the Honorable Frank Cavalli, Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Space Acquisition and Integration. I was fortunate to meet Frank when he was the Deputy Director of the National Reconnaissance Office years ago. And what really stuck out to me was how he pushed to do the mission better and to break down barriers. Uh, he was one of those folks that would not settle for the answer of that's how we've always done things. And he really pushed NRO in ways that are just tremendously beneficial and that the warfighter benefits from today. So I was so pleased when I heard that you had been nominated for uh, this, this Air Force position because I knew you'd bring that same mentality to the Department of Defense. So with that, I wanted to turn the floor over to Secretary Cavelli for some opening thoughts, and then we'll have a few questions here. For the audience, both in person and online, in person, we have a QR code here, so we're gonna open up time at the end for questions. Click on the QR code, and that'll take you to uh, an online submission. And then for folks online, if you look at the event page, there's a button there where you can click, uh, click it to ask a question. And I'll take in all those questions and, and get through as many as I can. So Secretary Cavelli, welcome. Thank you, Carrie. You know, it's, it's all about speed, right? That's been the big, the big push in space acquisition is speed and going fast. And it, one of the key factors in that is program execution. It's really about delivering programs on cost and schedule that work. I mean, every time we delay a program or we overrun a program, basically we have to use funds from our future investments in modernization or future investments in R&D to cover those overruns. And that takes away a big essence of speed. 
So I did put together these three memos, and I promise I'm done with memo writing. That, that it's exactly what I wanted, I envisioned when I took the job. I wanted to get out there in terms of guides. So the space tenets, the formula for going fast, which is really short, and then now the skills for my government actors and professionals that I want them to have. But it really all comes down to executing. And, it, and, and it's, it's easier said than done, right? The government needs to get into the habit in their action strategies and in their RFPs and their source selection plans of awarding contracts that are realistic in terms of schedule, realistic in terms of cost, and to an organization that actually can do the job technically, right? And then once under contract, once we've awarded a realistic contract, it is managed relentlessly that baseline day to day and deliver that program on cost and on schedule. That is a key element of speed. And we need industry's help because there's a historic precedent where industry likes to low bid programs. And the government likes to award to the low bid. And then the government has to then fix the program down the road because the low bid isn't the proper bid on the program. That has to stop. We need to have win-win situations where industry submits to us realistic cost, realistic schedule, and have the technical skills to do the job. And the government needs to manage the baseline with industry and deliver on cost and schedule. We can't afford any more to rob our future to pay for the past. And so that's been a big theme of mine. Uh, one of the reasons why I wrote that third memo, it's, it's all throughout the nine space actors and tenants that I put together back in 20, October 22. And it's really what I'm pushing for over the course of the next year or so in, in this job. Well, and, and on that, so in the last two years, you've issued space acquisition tenants, a formula for going fast, and now this memo on execution and, and recommendations for program managers on, on, on how to successfully execute a program. I guess my, my question is, why did you do all of this? I mean, that reading those memos, they seem like such common sense, solid items. So, so why the need to do it? So I'm really, I'm really fortunate that I have an amazing action organization, organization supporting me in terms of SSC, Space Systems Command, Space RCO, and Space Development Agency, as well as my own staff at the Pentagon. But I, I, think, I think Congress was absolutely brilliant in, in separating out the SAE roles, because I think space was such a small part of the Air Force that I'm not quite sure how much attention they actually got from the SAE before. By, by having me in this role here, we've been able to streamline things dramatically. Like, my PEOs, my program executive officers, have access to me 24 by 7. There's no pre-briefs or staffing of packages. There's no huge bureaucracy. But I, the reason for writing the memos was just kind of almost like commander's intent. Like, this is how I want you all to behave. We need to go fast. We have threats against our systems in space. Our architecture grew up in a time where, you know, launch was a pain in the neck and really expensive. We tended to build very large satellites over many, many years of development and we put them all at geo. I mean, that's the predominant uh, Air Force, Space Force architecture is geosynchronous, except for G GPS, which is down in, in uh, me uh, medium Earth orbit. We need, to tr we need to transform from those big, juicy targets, I think, as John Hiding quoted, at GEO, to much more proliferated systems, much more diverse orbits of our systems. And the way we need to do that, we need to do it with speed, given the threats that we face against uh, folks out there. And so the tenets really were, and the formula really was, here's how I expect you to behave to go fast. And then the, the skills memo was really sort of, here's the skills I expect you to learn as action professionals. But it's all tied towards going fast and just setting that commander's intent. And so far, I've been really, really impressed with the, um, I like keeping things short. No one likes to read. The Twitter generation does not like reading stuff really long, right? So I think three pages was the longest memo, right? So I'm not writing novels or 20 pages, 30 page kinds of things. So that was totally intentional on my part. Make it really easy to read. Um, but so far, I'm seeing it take off. But something simple like deliver ground before launch. I have had such a positive response from the team on that, but I think it's something that no one's ever said to them before, right? So at the NRO, we knew that was always the case, right? We weren't always perfect at it, but we always strive to deliver ground before it's launch. Why? Why would you launch a satellite that you can't use, right? All you're doing is getting, using a, a life of the vehicle at that point in time. But that was something that I'm not sure anybody has ever said to the great folks out at SSC, and they have responded, and they are, they are all planning their programs accordingly now. And so it's really a key. I remember, you know, I'll tell you why I think that. I, I happened to be on the NRO, one of the NRO reps on the 2004 or 5 Num McCurdy breach on Sibbers. Mm -hmm. 
and I just, I don't know, I just, someone picked me to go out and help out uh, beyond that. And I remember we were talking to the prime contractor doing space, and then we went and saw the ground pieces. And we were predicting at the time the first vehicle wouldn't launch until about 2009, I think the IRT came up with. And, and, and they said they wouldn't have ground in place before they launched it. I'm like, you got, your vehicles are years late. How could you not have ground in place before you launch? But that was sort of the culture that, that wasn't that a priority for them. And so I thought that was just, re that really stuck with me my whole, my whole time at the NRO, that the ground needs to be there. Well, and, and on that, sometimes, I mean, I'll say we use the word space acquisitions very monolithically, but there's much nuance and there's a spectrum of different types of space capabilities that we're acquiring from the big exquisite to some of these smaller systems to ground to software, et cetera. So can you give me a sense of with these memos and with this particular uh, recent memo on execution, how do you make this tangible? You've got, the train has left the station on some of these big programs. I mean, we still have challenges with the GPS ground station, uh, with space command and control. How do you, day to day in the Pentagon, um, bring those tenets to life when you have programs where trains have already left the station? Right, so for the traditional programs that already left the station, the best thing to do is just manage the hell out of them. Right, get them over the finish line, get them done, get them finished. For my troubled programs, OCX, Atlas, MGUE, which is the GPS M code receiver, what we do is, um, I, well, I meet bi-weekly with every PEO, just a half hour phone call, and they're allowed to tell me anything they want to talk about or I ask them any questions I want to. For those three troubled programs, just the Atlas and OCX, the PEO and the program manager meet with me every two weeks as well separately and walk through status of the program. And I think just having a dedicated SAE who's worrying about the space programs. I think we've been able to, to really put a focus on these things. We're still not over the hump yet on a couple of those programs. Atlas, I think, has made some significant progress this past year. Uh, they just had their Skit 6, which is their Agile Sprints, and they did a really nice job with it. So I'm optimistic with that program. OCX keeps having challenges, and uh, I think we're, we just moved out a little bit further than what I had hoped we would do. I thought we'd have it in place next summer. It looks like it's gonna be a little bit further out. But, um, you know, just meeting with the team and having a dedicated SAE who's focused on the space acquisition itself, I think, is starting to make a difference. But for those traditional programs that we kind of started, Next Gen Geo, Next Gen Polar, um, you know, stuff that was already well in acquisitions and in trouble like OCX, I mean, Forge, other things, I think the trick is just really keep a focus on it and deliver on schedule. And, and put that emphasis out there that I expect my program managers to deliver on schedule. That is an expectation I have. And then the Space Development Agency is touted as, as an example of this approach and the emphasis on speed. What has been most challenging there in terms of execution and what lessons are you learning that you're feeding back into the ecosystem? I think everyone's starting to see that you can't build big fast. I, I just, you just can't. And I, I've got that experience coming from the NRO. And so SDA has shown that when you build smaller systems, you can go fast, like less than three years. When you use a commercial bus, like SCA is doing, they're using the bus from York for some of their tranche one transport. Lockheed's one of their primes using a tran orbital bus off the shelf. Uh, Northrop is doing a great job using an arrow bus from Airbus off the shelf. When you build smaller and you take advantage of a commercial bus and you take advantage of existing technology, you're not reinventing the wheel, you're putting Link 16 and KA band antennas that exist on a satellite, you could damn well go fast. I think people are starting to, to really take note of that and see that, that speed can come from that kind of formula. I'm gonna shift ge gears here. So re-optimization. Last week at the Air Force Association's Warfare Symposium, Secretary Kendall and General Saltzman announced 24 key decisions to optimize the Department of the Air Force for great power competition. Um, some of the things that stuck out to me on the space front were the establishment of a Space Futures Command and then a common officer training course, which I thought was really interesting. Um, we have yet to see the details about Space Futures Command, but can you at least share some insights and maybe in particular, how would you expect this new Futures Command to impact space acquisitions? Sure. Well, first, I, I loved everything we did with the Great Power Competition. I think the country's fortunate to have Secretary Kendall in that role right now because I think he's done some amazing things. But the GPC stuff was awesome. You, you probably noticed there wasn't much done on the Space Act side because, I mean, that kind of stuff's been, we've been working it since, since the day I arrived. Uh, I like the thought of the Space Futures Command a lot 
what their role is, one of their roles, they have many roles, but one of their roles is going to be to help us prioritize R&D investments. We have not done a really good job in terms of optimizing our R&D pipelines to go from what do we really need as a, war, as, a, as, a, as a space force to getting these things into 6.1, 6.2 basic R&D, into demonstrations, 6.3, 6.4 colors, and then into, act, into operations. And so Space Futures Command is going to help prioritize what are the key things we should be going after. I'll have the role from an ACT perspective, making sure that AFRL actually execute those things and that we do demos that are going to lead to real operational capability as opposed to demos for the sake of doing demos. So I think that's one of the key things. And then Secretary Kendall has also said that the U.S. must be ready for a, a quote, kind of war we have no modern experience with, end quote. So that urgency, that security picture, I mean, do you see that then permeating within the space acquisition portfolio? Yeah, absolutely. So well? Secretary Kendall is very fond of saying it's China, China, China. I like to say on space acquisition, it is speed, speed, and speed. And so the tenants and the formula were really designed to change our culture to go faster, right? We traditionally build, like I said, bigger systems, seven year, eight year, 10 year development cycles. It's really, we just can't, we can't do that anymore. And we're very fortunate that the launch environment has changed so much that you can build smaller and launch much more cost effectively today. And, and so, you know, we've been driving since, from, since, since my arrival on speed across the whole acquisition space action portfolio, so. Okay, so part of that speed needs to be applied to the front end of the space acquisition process, which is requirements and I'll say force design. So we have this organization called the SWAC, the Space Warfighting Analysis Center. They are responsible for that force design, the modeling and analysis of different space architectures that then lead to requirements on what we should build. Yep. My question for you though is, are we actually seeing different acquisition strategies emerging from that work or vice versa, are your acquisition tenants being infused into what the SWAC is doing? It opens different design trades. It sure does. Uh, I, so SWAC is a fabulous organization yeah. doing some really great work and we work very closely with them. If you look at where SWAC did, even, even before my arrival, they pushed for sort of this Leo Mio layer for missile warning as our future beyond the traditional kind of Sibris class set of systems that we're building now with next gen geo, next gen polar. That's a proliferated system, both at Mio and proliferated both at Leo. So SWAC has done, I think, a fantastic job understanding the technical trends and actually driving towards proliferation. Something that, that we were, we were going to do on our side, they're already doing on their end, and STA is doing on their end. So I, I think it's worked out really nicely. But they do a great job tracking what the art of the possible is technically wise, and that does go into their force designs. And then your, your tenants as well, does that go into their force design Absolutely. trade space? Yep. Okay. okay. Okay, fixed price. And I know that's been a hot topic amongst uh, our industry partners as well is you know, you've advocated and, and in your memo explicitly um, discussed uh, fixed price contracting as, as an area of emphasis. And it's received mixed reaction, I think, from industry. So while you're attempting to move faster and shift to these proliferated architectures with existing systems, you're also still developing new complex systems. So next generation OPIR or strategic communications might be examples of that. So can you add a bit of nuance to this topic? When do you use fixed price contracts? How do you think about risk and how do you think about incentivizing industry? That's a great question. So the formula that we wrote was very specific. Build smaller, low NRE, use existing technology, use fixed price, those are all, and then three years from contract award to launch. Those are all elements of the formula. So that low NRE, that use existing technology, one, I need to do that to drive speed, but two, when you're using fixed price, you'd like to have, you're not doing the first of a kind, first inventing something new. And so, so I'm a little bit confused by some of the bigger primes who say they're, they're against that. They should not be against that. I haven't said I'm gonna go build the next generation Battlestar Galactica that never been built before fixed price. What I said was in the formula was smaller, existing technology, fixed price, three years contract award to launch. So I've been pretty clear about that. I think that depending on the situation, if you have a very high NRE or first of a kind, there's probably different strategies. I think so, for example, I think the Space Force has done a really nice job with the middle tier acquisition authorities where they might actually bring on multiple vendors, try building stuff, get some engineering design units built, and then move on to an acquisition effort beyond that. But we look at each acquisition individually. 
and then we try to marry it up with the best strategy. But when we're doing smaller proliferated systems using existing technology, fixed price works just fine. Okay, because I can imagine, you know, as we look to replenish our nuclear command and control right. systems, there's a, I'll say, a higher degree of you know, radiation hardening that will be yep. needed. And we've you know, seen just in the last couple of week or so just how acute, acutely um, some of those kind of capabilities will be needed. That will require design work. That, you bet. That may not necessarily fit that fixed contracting mold. You bet. And, and in fact, um, so that program, which is the, the uh, ESS, the Evolved Strategic SATCOM program, right? We're working in draft RFPs as we speak on that program. You know, we, I was under the perception that the MTA, the military acquisition, actually was producing a prototype, but it seems like we spent a lot of time in the MTA just doing tech risk reduction or technology maturity. It's not as far as long as I would like for us to probably use fixed price. And had we built a real payload or actually built a prototype of the satellite, then hey, maybe, maybe it's time to actually go off and do something fixed price. But I think given the amount of energy that still has to go in the program and feedback I've gotten from industry, as we revise that act strategy, we are probably looking at probably going more towards a traditional cost plus model for something like that. And then for fixed price to work, and you and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, is there's a bit of appetite suppressant yeah. that's required, both on the government side setting requirements, but as well as on the industry side being realistic about what they can, they can offer at a, at a certain cost. Right. So how do you think about that? I think, I think the whole thing needs to be win-win. I want industry to make a fair profit, and I want the government to get a capability that it wants on cost and schedule. And, and the reality is I just need industry to bid properly, right? Don't low bid me and think that we're going to award it and then, and then fix it later. I, it's, I'm at the point now where I can't afford to keep paying for poorly awarded contracts in the past. I'd rather cancel stuff and start over. And so I, I need industry to get out of the mode of low bidding. I need the government to get in the mode of awarding realistic proposals that we could actually execute. Okay, I want to jump to commercial as well. This is another hot topic, so commercial data and services. Many have been critical that the Department of Defense and Space Force leadership, they're saying the right thing on commercial, but that the programs and budgets don't necessarily match that rhetoric. There are also critiques that DOD's acquisition models, funding models are not well aligned to purchasing commercial services, or perhaps it can take full advantage of efficiencies within commercial, commercial operations. Um, what do you think needs to change to enable greater acquisition of commercial space data and services? So what, what I've seen is in, in the past, we look at every program as a stovepipe. So you might have multiple programs that are in the space domain awareness portfolio, mm -hmm. and each one's a separate program with a separate set of requirements. And until recently, um, we weren't looking at them as, an, as, as, a, as a mission area. And so there's uh, some amazing individuals in S5 and S7 who are now changing the way we do business and, and looking at the requirements from a mission perspective. So space domain awareness, we've all been together. Satellite communications all been together, as an example. Missile warning all been together. And when you get programs like space domain awareness and, and satellite communications, and you see all the requirements together and not broken up into seven different programs, you could then start to envision how can commercial play a better role? And that's a trick I learned from my friends over at Westfield in terms of putting all the requirements together and then seeing what can be allocated to commercial first. And so we're taking a similar model within the department. And I haven't seen the latest revised draft of our commercial strategy, but we wrote those words sort of in, in, a, in part of the approach to actually start bending the requirements together and then looking off the top, what can commercial do first? Then once we find out what commercial can and can't do, then you start looking at what programs do I need to, to acquire to get the rest of it. That, that very much is a paradigm-breaking shift from how they've traditionally done business. Right, but that's, I think, what we need to do is get out of program-by-program program requirements and look at portfolio requirements. And the, the, the folks in the CISRO or S5SA are doing that as we speak. Well, and then related to that, what role do you see the government playing in establishing or creating market demand in some of these newer areas of commercialization? You know, tactically responsive space, which we talked to General Gutlein about last month, space situational awareness, even space service saying that's on the horizon here. Yeah. You know, is it, is it truly commercial if the government has to be the anchor tenant? Right? I mean, that's one thing to think about. And I, I've, always, I've always argued in my time in the IC that if the government's the only tenant using it, then it's really not truly commercial. I do think the government needs to, to, to figure out how to send a demand signal 
the, uh, the strategy that's gonna come out from the Space Force is, is quite good. And in that strategy, I was really impressed with the fact that we kind of say, these are things that we are, think are inherently governmental things, like nuclear command and control, like missile warning. But these are other things that we think the commercial market may play a bigger role in, like clearly like launch like we're doing today, like space domain awareness, like satellite communications. And so I, I think part of that strategy when it comes out is going to be to help signal where we see commercial playing a bigger role for us as opposed to try, just having commercial try to guess. And I imagine by establishing that market demand up front, you're able to then shape what the commercial sector goes off and invests private capital in. Yeah, we're, we're very fortunate that the space economy is sort of in a boom right now. And we're, we're just, there's an amazing set of companies now that are just, I don't know, it seems like a new one crops up every day doing something really cool in space. And so um, I think the opportunities are almost, are almost endless. What I, what I want to hit upon is the fact that um, I know, you know, if we, I, I'm sure you're going to ask me somewhere along the way about the valley of death and has anybody kind of made it over the valley. You know, Space Development Agency just announced a few months back their Tranche 2 stuff. Guess who are primes? Rocket Lab and Sierra Space. That's awesome. That is really cool that the space economy is booming so much that we have choices out there, you know, to go off and do for, for critical programs like what Space Development Agency is doing with Tranche 2. If I look at Space Systems Command, there's this amazing small software house in Colorado named SciTech. They do all the missile warning processing, and they're damn good at it. Right? So we're not confined to going to more traditional primes for that software. We went to a real software house to go do it. So I see, I see a lot of innovation in the Space Force, and I see a lot of newer companies coming in to take on a much bigger role than they had done traditionally, and I'm very excited about that. But I think it's all driven by the fact that there's this amazing space economy that's booming inside the United States today. Well, I want to key in on what you had just said earlier, which is on inherently governmental. I think sometimes I'll, I'll say we hear from the outside of, Commercial can't do this because one, it's inherently governmental, or two, we're we, we, we the government don't own or operate it. You know, Starlink maybe is, is an example there where there's concern. The government is concerned; it, it can be shut off. I guess how do you think about that? I'd say what, you know, as I've been looking into this inherently governmental, a lot of it comes down to it's the it's the human decision making, not necessarily the, the the system or the capability that's being acquired. So how do you reconcile and think through those? Well, I mean, for any kind of commercial service you use, you write a contract. I've never seen a company in, over my 36 year career now in the government stop following their contract. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not up to individuals and the companies, it's up to the contract, it's on in the contract. So, so I am absolutely not worried at all about buying a commercial service and it not being there. I think it always will be there. The, um, the more we use commercial and the more adversaries think we're using commercial, the better off we are. I want them to believe that every Starlink, Kuiper, OneWeb, Viasat satellite is a military asset that could be being used by the Department of Defense. Boy, that complicates their targeting. <laughs> that would drive anybody crazy. That's tens of thousands of satellites. So yeah, the more commercial we can use, the merrier. It's only gonna help us make our architecture more resilient. And then are we seeing an active discussion on what's the government's obligation then that maybe help protect or provide uh, threat uh, information to uh, them? I don't know how you protect 20,000 satellites, <laughs> but that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a whole different technology challenge. <laughs> um, your, your recent memo on essential program management skills includes an item on understanding how industry operates and what motivates them. So, so how do you think about ways to improve the government's understanding of industry, but also it's, it's understanding how private capital works. Right. I think that's really important. So um, I learned a lot by reading 10Ks. And so what I'm, I've been encouraging my staff and all my program managers is to go out and read the annual 10K report and, and understand the quarterly earnings that are out there. I learned so much reading like a prime, big primes 10K report. Like I had no idea coming from the space out of the house that like I think 26% of all the revenue at Lockheed Martin a year of their $66 billion revenue came from the F-35 program. That's huge, right? I mean, the quarter of all their revenue comes from a single program. I, I just never envisioned that. I was doing research trying to figure out how much money Lockheed and Boeing were making off of ULA and I end up just stumbling upon the, just reading all these 10Ks to figure it out. And I just learned tons about the company. And so I've been bringing that message to my team saying, hey, you know, it's important. Now, I grew up, I got an MBA, 
And so I, I knew how to do top level financial ratios. I understand, you know, free cash flow and profit and revenue, all that mischief, right? And RI. But I want my program managers to understand what drives industry. And it's a good thing, right? I, I want industry to make money, make revenue, and make profit. And I, I need my guys to understand that. The other thing my, guy, my folks need to understand is you have to understand what else is on that company's plate. I will tell you that if you're working with a, a space factory, a big prime, and my friends at Westfields has a huge program going through that's fixed price, and maybe my friends at NASA has a huge program going through that factory fixed price, and we're the only cost plus program in the factory, you're not delivering on cost and schedule because you're paying the bills for everything else in that factory that, when they have issues with their fixed price programs. So our folks need to be knowledgeable about what's being done by that particular company they're about to work with so they understand sort of the risks of their program by doing that. And what I also find interesting is, back to the private capital too, is this is not U.S. taxpayer dollars, but this is private capital going to these firms for them to do the upfront research and development, building, launching, operating satellites, and then the government back to, can buy a service. But those investors need to know where they need to place those dollars. Right. And we're very fortunate. We've got amazing organizations like the Defense Innovation Unit mm -hmm. that works with the private capital. They, uh, we've got uh, a new Office of Strategic Capital and R&E that does a lot of that work. And then we've got our great f friends that's Air Force Works and Space Works that do it as well. So, I mean, the Department of Defense does a really, I think, a fantastic job in, in engaging with industry and, and putting out that demand signal. So industry, space industrial base, when we've observed, I know Cynthia and her team have done some phenomenal work looking at the de defense industrial base, supply chains, things like munition shortfalls that we're seeing acutely in Ukraine and in Israel, shipbuilding capacity. So what is the state of the space industrial base to support the Space Forces acquisition strategy? Again, I think the space economy is great right now, right? So, I mean, we're seeing a lot of opportunity, a lot of choices across different organizations, different companies. There's a... Uh, there's two phrases I absolutely hate. COVID caused me to be delayed, and supply chain caused me to be delayed. We, we know about challenges in supply chain. This is not new on the space side of the house with small components. It just means we have to be smarter in terms of our companies ordering stuff earlier. But yeah, our, we tend to have people who want to make excuses, and they, I still get companies coming saying, oh, I'm late, COVID. Well, COVID's been over for a couple of years now, guys, so that's not an excuse anymore, but they still use it and they still use the plot chain as an excuse. I have seen a lot of smaller space companies have absolutely no issues with supply chain. I see it more fundamentally in our bigger primes that whine about supply chain, and I think they are the ones that have the resources and the assets to actually do something about it and actually be smarter. I mean, it all comes down to just plan early, right? Buy your parts early, get your orders in, or be organized, be effective, but yeah, it, it, can't stand when they come in and tell me supply chain or COVID is, is why they can't meet their schedule. I think it's a lack of planning why they can't meet their schedule. Well, and on, on the munitions shortfall issue, you know, there is some significant investment required to f facilitize or capacitize sure. for more. But, yeah. um, and those are decisions that have to be made a couple of years I, in advance. How, correct. Is, is there any analogy here for the space industrial base? No, I, 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 my friends in the Army have done I thought, a magnificent job with what they've been able to do to get factories established and going for, for munitions, so kudos to them. On the space side of the house, I, I don't see it. I, I mean, there is occasionally there's parts issues out there in terms of capacitors and things like that, but again, if you plan properly and you're proactive, you should not have any issues. That's on the space side. I can't speak for air or for ground or for sea, but for space. And, you know, and two of the machines didn't say, hey, I'm late getting to the moon because of supply chain or COVID. Hmm. I'll come back to intuitive machines here because I've got some good questions from the audience. Classification. So it was announced last month, uh, a, a new DOD classification policy for space programs that completely rewrote 20-year-old policy. So how significant is that for you and what tangible changes will we start to see within the space acquisition portfolio as a result of that policy change? So one of my, one of my tenets I wrote back, wrote back in 22 was avoid SAPs and overclassifying. It limits our ability to integrate and it limits our ability to share. And one of the great things about space is it's the great enabler for the joint force. I mean, it truly needs to be integrated in with the air domains, the, the sea domains, and with the ground domains. And we can't do that if every space program is in its own individual SAP. And so this allows us now to take a lot of programs that are in individual stovepipe saps 
and drop them down to the TS level and so that we could actually now start to share more amongst ourselves and integrate space to become the great enabler that it needs to be for the joint force. So I'm excited about it. I have a team actively working, taking a hard look at all the programs that I have that are in SAPS, and there's a bunch, and taking them out. Okay. So, what I loved about when you were at NRO is you really challenged the team, the system. You know, if, if, there's a, if there's a policy issue, let's identify it and let's fix it. Policy we can fix and change. Um, and you really pushed on the culture as well. So, you know, as I, I, we had General Gutlein in last month to talk about tactically responsive space, but he discussed this need for a MacGyver mindset. Um, I want to build on that and really that, that cultural and paradigm shift, cultural change and paradigm shift in a, in a few different areas, particularly as we go down this path towards more proliferated architectures. So first, um, with proliferated architectures, it becomes less about the satellites. You have hundreds of thousands of satellites that are basically nodes, nodes in, nodes in space, but more about that networking software, the ground architecture, the processing, yet our entire acquisition system, programs, budgets, they're aligned around the satellites, the sexy stuff. So how is our acquisition system adapting to that shift? So let's talk about MacGyver first. MacGyver used existing stuff around them, right, to always get out of a jam. And again, that's how we're going to get speed is by using existing technology. The one thing that I have noticed at uh, even in my previous job before and then here in the department is there's a, engineers and scientists tend to worship technology. Like if it's not new, it's not worth doing, right? You know, someone has an ASIC, they say, hey, this ASIC works and meets your requirements, but boy, if you let me respin it, I can get you 10% more efficiency. And we'd like, oh, that's cool, that's new, we worship technology. Or, hey, I've got a focal plane, and this one's off the shelf, you can use it today, but I could get this focal plane better for you, and I could even add the ROIC on top of it. And we say, yes, go ahead and do that. We, we, we need to stop worshiping technology and use the technology that's available to us to go fast. And then when we do that, we actually get better tech refresh. Let's take space-based infrared. I think program started in the late 90s. First satellite delivered in 2009. Last satellite delivered in 2022. The first tech refresh is with NextGen Geo, which launched in 25. We have a 25-year gap in tech refresh for missile warning, all because of slow development cycles and worshiping new technology. SDA has an opportunity to on-ramp new tech every two and a half years. Every two and a half years. That is stunning. That is an amazing away ability. Because people say to me, you don't want to use existing tech. You always want to go new. No, I don't want to go new. I want to use, like MacGyver did, existing technology. And then as I come up with more and more devices every three years with a, through a tranche, I could add new capabilities to it that are available. So it's going to fundamentally change. And it's going to help get past some of these valley of death things because I, have, now, I now have a chance. I mean, just think about that. 25 years for any new technology for missile warning to go, from, to go on orbit, down to now I'm, every three years I'm able to update the technology. That's dramatic. So MacGyver's duct tape in this case is the software, the networking, the data processing. How no, do it's, you... It's, it's, it's the focal planes, the star trackers, the Link 16 antennas, the KA band comm systems. It's the payloads. And, and it's, then it's, all, it's then it's using the commercial bus as opposed to building a bus themselves, right? And now if I, if I think about are we just focused on space? I don't think so. If you look at my budget, there's a whole bunch of ground stuff going on. Okay. You know, I mean, so Forge is the major ground system that's being built in different pieces for, um, for the missile warning system. Uh, Griffin is a program that's a whole bunch of different ground components, different contracts that are going to be let for build all the ground for the AH ESS follow-on. You've got, dare I say, OCX, right? That's a ground piece. Um, Atlas Space C2, there's, there's, a, there's a dramatic amount of ground programs out there, including SDA's got their operations ground segment, their O&I, they call it, that's out there, that's being built right now by Iridium and GD for Tranche 1 satellites. And so there's a, there's, a, there's a series of focus on ground things going on. Okay, tasking, this is a paradigm shift as well. And the Space Force is working with your old shop, the National Reconnaissance Office, on a space-based system to track moving targets on the Earth's surface, so GMTI, ground-based moving target indicator. So with so many satellites on orbit, just these legacy centralized tasking approaches just may not be 
effective. Maybe I think more of like Uber and the supply demand matching. My sense is when you were at the NRO, it act, te technology wasn't the issue. It right. really was more of the culture and policy. What's your, what's your observation and what's, how, how are you looking at this here? I'm with Cascade. you, it's policy. So we are clearly moving away from airborne ISR assets and moving into space is the absolute right thing to do from a resiliency and survivability perspective. The policies about space ISR were written in the 80s and 90s, maybe even the 70s, right? When we were trying to sort of manage a much smaller constellation of national systems. I think the policies, I think the DNI and DOD both need to review the policies about tactical ISR systems in space and allow them to have the same control same classification and same direct downlinks that tactical airborne ISR systems have today. I think if we drive tactical ISR in space to be more like national technical means, the country will lose, the warfighter will lose. These systems that we're building in partnership with the IC and others need to allow for unclassified data down, direct downlink to theater and to ships and to our army units and to our air force planes and units for, for, for weapons flight updates. And they need to be, um, really, really um, tasked and controlled and owned by the Department of Defense. And it's all doable, but I think the legacy policies of the 70s, 80s, and 90s need to be updated. Okay, one more culture question from me, and then I'm gonna jump here to audience questions. So, programming and budgeting. Space development agencies, large number of smaller satellites. It's breaking another paradigm. So, rather than these large procurement spikes every several years in the budget, they're requiring a steady state of funding. 2 billion to 4 right. billion a year right. for satellites, ground, communications architecture, et cetera. That is much more aligned to a software model of incremental improvement over time. So how do you see, you know, as you've talked about acquisition strategy, so the acquisition strategy paired with programming and budgeting processes, how are those being adapted to that different approach? So, so the, we've all adapted to that approach already. I don't think it's required any kind of significant change it's just a matter of, just like you said, having that steady stream for each of their tranches as they get put in place, right? So we already defined tranche two. In fact, we got some stuff under contract for tranche two already. And then, um, knowing Derek and team, they're, they're great. They're probably already thinking ahead of what's gonna happen in tranche three. So, so far, it hasn't required any kind of changes in terms of how we do budgeting to allow that capability to go. I think the real thing to look out for is adoption of the services. So right now we're sort of in demo mode for SDA. We've got 23 satellites uh, up on orbit. Uh, eight of them are, tra are, are, uh, are tracking. Uh, the other ones, 19 or so, I'm sorry, yeah, or so were our transport. And we're just in kind of a demo mode with a demo ground. So we start launching tranche one satellites for transport in September. We, we deliver our ground system this summer. And I think once you get those on orbit and operational, the trick will be bringing on board the services, getting people to actually use them. That's the magic of SDA. So SDA has proven they can build stuff quick and they can get it on orbit quick and they prove that it works. Now it's gonna be adoption once we get tranche one in. So that's something you all should be looking out for is are the services actually using the services we put up in space? If they don't use it, that's not worth doing. And is Congress coming along as well? They're used to seeing procurement spike in one year to deliver two satellites. You're spreading that out. How, I, I, have, they coming along? I have not seen anybody but anything but support for SDA on the Hill, which is really kind of neat. And they deserve the old support they're getting because they are actually doing it. They are executing the plan, right? They're delivering their programs on cost, they're delivering them on schedule, and they're launching them, and they work, right? I, you know, when they first did their first block of launches back in um, March of, or April, of, April 1st of last year, I thought, hey, you know, if, if five of 10 of these satellites work, I'd be happy, right? Because it's a $14 million spacecraft. And so you could take a risk on a $14 million spacecraft. Um, they all worked. Pretty impressive feat by both SDA and New York team. And then if I, if I look at like, um, like a program when it comes to risk, like I, I'm more than happy to take risk on a proliferated system. Next gen geos cost me close to $4 billion a copy. I ain't taking any risk there at all. <laughs> because, I mean, cause, because if that program fails, that's $4 billion of taxpayers funds gone. Right? And so the risk posture is a lot different on programs like SDA is doing. I'm glad you hit on that as well, because that's a great issue of, is in terms of how do you look at risk, because that is a paradigm shift. Is, is If you're buying dozens, hundreds, you can afford to take more risk, yep. and if one or two fail, you're still, your mission is yep. still. I'd rather fail on a 14 to $20 million spacecraft than a, a $4 billion spacecraft any day. Yeah. 
Okay, let me shift to a couple audience questions here because we've had many come in. I'm gonna start with a university student. So this is Tull Osman from American University. How does the recent Odysseus spacecraft landing on the moon yesterday, uh, the first US landing since the early 70s, how does it affect the programs that you're working on? I think the big thing to see is that, you know, commercial got to the moon. That's pretty damn cool. And it also shows that innovative companies like Intuitive Machines have capabilities out there for folks to take advantage of. And I think we need to open our aperture and not solely rely on the traditional primes in space, but take advantage of the traditional primes plus all of the other in, uh, Intuitive Machine type companies that are evolving out there. And so I think it's just very eye-opening from the standpoint of an extremely difficult task being done by a commercial company. So congratulations to that team. Great. Okay, uh, from Tony Capaccio at Bloomberg News. Hello, Tony. Uh, this is a bit more, and I'll say the lessons learned bucket from your time at NRO. What impact did the NRO's FIA failure, the future imagery architecture, and then he also adds the 2018 SpaceX Zuma Israeli payload failure, have on your current approach to space acquisition management? So lessons learned from your time at NRO. Well, I could you know, definitely talk about the, you know, the challenges the NRO had with FIA. I was around for some of that and heard some of the outbriefs and saw some of the lessons learned and IRT findings. I, I mean, you know, there's a lot there. <laughs> and, and it all comes down to realism, right? You need to have realistic programs and you need to have a prime that has the domain expertise to execute those programs. And, and you know, when you award a cost plus contract, all of the risk is 100% square on the government. And you know, that was one of the, I remember, I remember one of the fee IRTs out briefing and a senior team of individuals that came in to do an ind independent review said to, to a bunch of us at the time, junior officers said, you know what the best thing you could possibly do with the competitive cost volume and a cost plus contract in the competitive environment? Throw it out, cause it's worthless. Because there's no, there's no benefit to giving you an honest, realistic answer in that environment unless you really drive towards that. And the NRO since then has done really a magnificent job in making cost realism a central hub in how they do their competitive proposal reviews. And it's something that we're trying to adopt more into the space force of how do you do cost realism. And again, it all comes down to awarding a contract that you could execute on cost and on schedule so that you're not in this constant set of throwing money at it and fix it later. And so that's really some of the key lessons I learned at the NRO. Um, now, this is uh, Courtney Albon from Defense News asks that you've said in the past uh, that the Space Force will use its contractor watch list uh, when necessary. Have you used this tool since you've been in the position and are, and are there any troubled programs that are on your watch list where you might be considering it? Yeah. the. Um, I, I'm not supposed to comment in public about the watch list. Okay. According to my general counsel. <laughs> and I'll just leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> okay, Courtney, you can come talk to Frank afterwards here. Um, let's see. I want to shift to international. We have Phil Tin from a, a European independent research organization asked the question of, given the objectives of optimizing research and development pipelines, how can allied companies such as Norway you know, within the Arctic region play a role? Is there new guidance and is there a new guidance and an engagement program for international R&D collaboration? So I'm not sure there's any new guidance just yet as we as we start to, to re-optimize those pipes, but clearly there's a, a, a great role for allies. And so, for example, SSC did this magnificent program called EPSR. It's the Enhanced Polar System. Um, R, I forget what the R stands for, but um, recapitalization. And we're hosting it on a Norwegian payload that's going up, on a Norwegian satellite going up next summer. And it's really kind of neat. And so we've had great opportunities dealing with the allies, whether it be things like our, our deep uh, space radar system called DARK that we're putting in Australia and in, great, in, in England. We've had great opportunities working with Norway on EPSR. Uh, we're doing other things uh, across the globe with allies, with Japan and others. And so, um, so I think there's always a lot of great opportunity from the R&D perspective to work with our allies. Okay. Okay. So here's, I have a question from industry, uh, from an industry uh, participant here. And, um, you know, given the news that has emerged over the last week on Russia potentially developing 
uh, some sort of space-based nuclear or anti-satellite weapon. The question is more, you know, as we look at what Space Development Agency is doing and the push for LEO, low Earth orbit, proliferated architectures, including in the areas of missile warning, are we putting too many of our eggs in that basket given threats in that domain? How do you look at proliferation as one part of the strategy? Are there other things that we should be looking at as well? Um, particularly given some of these, these, these extreme threats. You know, I, I think that uh, proliferation of LEO is, is one approach to resiliency. Other approaches include also that we need to be doing more of is diversification of orbits. Okay. And so if you look at the history of the, of the department, most of our stuff was in GEO, right? Except for GPS, most of our stuff was in GEO. All of our missile warning, all of our MILSATCOM kind of capabilities. And so I'm an advocate of proliferation everywhere. I think we should be proliferating more at MEO. We should be proliferating more at GEO as well. And, uh, and so I think we're taking the first steps through SDA with proliferation of LEO, but I also see us proliferating more at other orbits and trying stranger orbits too as well. Okay. I like that. Okay, we've got a question from Wes Hallman at Beacon. I saw Wes here in the audience there. Hey, great to see you. Um, how has the oversight from the Hill changed since the establishment of Space Force? Has it kept up with the changes? Has it helped or has it hindered? I, I think Congress has been such a, an amazing supporter on all things space related. I mean, I mean, every committee has been fantastic to work with and just been a huge advocate. Um, there's pressure on me to go fast and, and there should be pressure on me on the Hill to go fast. And so I, I, I'm hoping that we're, we're meeting their expectations, but uh, I think the, the, what the Hill did to set up the Space Force and set up a separate SAE was, was really right on target. And I hope we make them proud, but so far we've been nothing but support from the Hill. That's great, and the Hill, the, the grandfathers of the Space Force really, you yeah, that, that movement really started in, in Congress, uh, thanks to uh, Chairman Rogers and Congressman Jim Cooper. Yep. Uh, so next question from Tom Carrico. He's a phenomenal colleague of ours here at CSIS. He runs our missile defense project, and his team just put out an excellent report on space-based sensing for missile warning and missile tracking. So he asks, how would you characterize the importance of fire control quality tracking requirements for space-based sensors being, development and what, being developed, and what can we expect for fire control quality tracking for missile defense purposes yeah, so in great, this decade? It's a, it's a great question. The, uh, so we're starting off with just trying to track. And so you probably saw on Valentine's Day, we launched uh, HBTSS from MDA, Missile Defense Agency, made two vehicles made it up, and four, the last four of Derek's Tron Zero um, SDA tracking satellites. So I, I think over the course of the next year, we'll get those systems up and running, and we'll, we'll learn a lot about our ability to actually track from space. And then I think once we learn that, I think we'll get a lot of insight into what do we need next in terms of getting to fire control. Okay, okay, good. Um, okay, next question. John Gaylor, our friend here at the Aerospace Corporation, great too, to see your name sh show up here, John. And I, John's been doing a lot of work on personnel, the personnel side of, of the Space Force. So how do you envision the future operating environment as the service balances acquisition and operational goals, and what impact does that have on the future workforce? Does it shift to more automated and contractor operations constructs like the commercial sector, or will there still be a significant guardian presence at ground stations to deliver the mission? And that really ties into some of these initiatives with these integrated mission deltas sure. where you're bringing acquisition and operations closer together. So let me, hey John, let me, let me talk a second about the future. I've always been an advocate that uh, probably our biggest threats are ground. And, and I would love to see a future, and I'm thinking way out there, that more satellites are autonomous. I really see a future where there are autonomous satellites with onboard processing. I mean, you think about what's in your iPhone today. I mean, there's no reason why we can't be doing much more stuff onboard processing and just downlink and tasking to wherever we, you need it to. So I, I envision a day down the road, maybe 20 years, where there's a lot less ground stations and a lot less operators, right? I mean, and then if you think about where all these commercial companies are going with direct to phone kind of service from space, you could almost envision you don't need ground terminals anymore. You can go directly through a commercial provider or commercial providers, right, in terms of these proliferate systems. So I see a future that's very autonomous and very much more onboard processing. And I think that makes us much more resilient and survival than a ground station with lots of people and lots of network connections inside that could be vulnerable to cyber. 
But that's just my personal view of the future. The, um, I really like what the Chiefs do and what the IMD construct. If you go and think about it, it's really nothing more than an integrated product team. Let's put everybody together in a mission area to go work from the problems. And so far, I'm really happy with the results I'm seeing out of the two that we're trying with PNT and EW. And I look forward to supporting the Chief Salzman in terms of continuing that. I think it's a great idea. Well, that, you know, as I think about back to the acquisition and uh, an operator sitting side by side, I think about Starlink being used in Ukraine and the jamming that the Russians have attempted to do. I'm envisioning there's some, uh, an op center here in California where you have, uh, you know, the coders sitting next to the operators and just real time making those, making those changes, adapting on the fly. Um, so seeing that also embraced by Space Force, I think is very good. Okay, two more questions here. Um, one is... Um, Fiscal year 2024, we're up against two really big deadlines here. March 8th, Congress needs to pass a budget or we're back in either government shutdown or continuing resolution. But then the kicker here is by, the end, by April 30th, if we don't have all appropriations bills passed, we're in sequestration land again with additional cuts. So from a space acquisition perspective here, what, what's the impact if Congress doesn't do its job here? There's two really bad impacts, right? The first is this... We, we, we worked really hard as a team within the Department of the Air Force to put together a set of operational imperatives. And the first year of funding for those imperatives is 24, and a lot of it is new work. And so they're new starts. And so basically all of our great ideas that the secretary drove and the team put together in terms of modernizing the department are all on hold without the 24 budget. And that, that would be a shame that we, if we don't get that. The second big impact, and that's the space and air-related stuff in there. The second big impact to us is launch. Uh, apparently, you know, what happens is in the CR is that you can only do what you had last year. We only bought three rockets last year. This year we want to buy 10. And so we'll be short seven rockets in our purchase this year, which means that seven satellites are going to sit on the ground longer than they should. And we can't really afford to do that from a resiliency and its perspectives. That really hurts us. And so I hope the budget passes. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if it doesn't, um, it hurts. It hurts really bad. So last question here from Madeline Chang. She's with our aerospace security program here as a fellow with the Horizon program. And they do a great job bringing people from the tech sector who want to get into public service. They bring them to DC and have them do fellowships. So we're really glad Madeline's here. But she asks, how do you ensure that your principles and programs endure past your tenure in the Pentagon? You know, that, 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 the, whole reason, the whole reason why I wrote them on official letterhead was for that reason, right? So it's got the, the DAF logo and my, and, and my seal on it and, and signed by me. And, uh, but I mean, so they're, they're, they're part of the, his, the historical record now as opposed to just like in an email, right? And so um, I hope that helps keep them, keep them around. Um, but, uh, you know, I, there's nothing mu much more I don't think I could do to really codify them beyond that. I, I think, again, the strategy I had of keeping them short and easy to read also helps because I think more people are more likely to read them than if you wrote, like, if I wrote, like, a 27-page thesis on what you should do in space acquisition. No, I, no I, even I wouldn't want to read it, right? But, but reading a couple pages and having a new person or somebody new to the Space Force come in and just read these simple to easy kind of follow guidelines and rules, um, I think will hopefully endure. So we'll see. Well, Secretary Cavelli, Frank, it is such a pleasure to have you here. I know we've been working on this for a while, so I'm glad we could finally make it happen. But it is so clear, even just from this short discussion, how much we see your passion, your drive, and just your push. Not, not settling, but really taking on that MacGyver mindset and pushing it through the department. So thank you so much for everything you're doing That's and for your service. Thank you so much. So thank Appreciate you. It.